So let's continue working our Z transform examples. We're going to work Z transform example number three now. In this example, we are going to work with the signal x of k, which is equal to minus alpha to the k, u of minus k minus 1. And we're going to do what we did before. We're going to find the z transform and the region of convergence of this z transform. So as usual, when we work these types of problems, we're going to start off with the definition of x of z. x of z is equal to a sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, x of k times z to the minus k which for our particular problem, since x of k is equal to minus alpha to the k, u of minus k minus 1, we have this. And now what we'll do is we'll simplify the limits. The quantity u of minus k minus 1, that's a unit step that exists for all negative time, mostly. When k is a negative number, the argument here is a positive number, so the unit step is on. The last value that it's on is when k equals minus 1. If k is equal to negative 1, this quantity is negative negative 1, which is 1, so you end up with 1 minus 1 is 0. So the last time this unit step is on is at time k equals a negative 1, and then it is off at k equals 0. So this sum simplifies to all negative time, stopping at time a negative 1. I'm going to factor out the negative sign out front, and then I'm left with just an alpha to the k, z to the minus k inside. So let's continue manipulating this into a form that we can solve easily. This is the same thing as alpha times z inverse quantity raised to the k. So I haven't changed anything there. Which is the same thing as minus the sum of k equals minus infinity to a negative 1 of alpha over z to the k. So this is getting closer to something we can easily write down the answer for based on kind of a table lookup approach. To get it a little bit closer, we need to do a change of variable. So I'm going to let n equal a negative k. When n is a negative k, then when k is negative infinity, that means n is infinity. So I need to replace this, this, and this with their equivalent values in the index n. So that's what I'm going to do here, one step at a time. So when k is a negative infinity, n is infinity. When k equals 1, so I'm worrying about this top index, since n is a negative k, that means n is 1. And then finally, right here, I need to figure out what k is equal to. And if I just rearrange this and solve for k, we see that k is equal to a negative n. So now I know how to replace all the quantities here with respect to the counter index n. So let's go ahead and rewrite that. The bottom index should be infinity. So it looks like this. And now we're getting closer, but now we have things raised to the negative n. So I can flip that. And instead of writing it as alpha over z to the negative n, I can write that as alpha over z to the negative n. And I've flipped the limits on the sum. So instead of summing from infinity to 1, I sum from 1 to infinity. That's totally equivalent. And now I'll go ahead and take care of the uh, negative n problem. I'll flip to z over alpha and raise that to the n. So these last couple steps, just simple changing the order of the summation, which doesn't change the answer. And then instead of having a negative n up here, I, I prefer much more to see a positive n, because that is my counter variable. And now finally, typically the thing I keep memorized is for sums that start at 0. And I'm starting at 1 right here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a little clever. I'm going to rewrite the sum, and I'm going to make this be a 0 here. When I made that a 0, what I actually did is I introduced an extra sum term into this summation. The term that I introduced was the n equals 0 term. So this quantity raised to the 0 is 1, and there's a negative sign out front. So really what I've done by changing this bottom limit is I've introduced a negative 1 into the sum. Well, I can't just change the answer if I want to have equality. So since I've added in a negative 1, I need to add a 1 to cancel that out. So now I am in a form that I know off the top of my head how to solve, and we can go ahead and do that. We know that this is going to converge anytime the magnitude of z is less than the magnitude of alpha, and if that's true, we can just write down the answer because it's in the form of a geometric sum. So I get 1 over 1 minus 0, because this quantity raised to this plus 1 gives us 0, and then on the denominator I have 1 minus z over alpha. So this is just a table lookup 
from the properties of a geometric sum. And now I can do a little bit of algebra to uh, rearrange this. 1 minus 0 is actually equal to 1. If I multiply top and bottom by alpha, this term turns into this term, so that's a little bit easier to deal with. I don't have the fraction on the denominator. And now I need to get a common denominator for this, so I multiply 1 by alpha minus z over alpha minus z, and then I can combine like terms, the alphas cancel, and what I end up with is negative z over alpha minus z, and then again if I multiply top and bottom by negative 1, that turns into z over z minus alpha. So what we've just done is we have solved for x of z and found that it's equal to z over z minus alpha for all the values of z whose magnitude is less than alpha. So again, that's our answer. Let's sketch what this region of convergence looks like. Here is my complex plane. Here is the point alpha. So the point alpha I've drawn, I've drawn on the real axis. I've assumed it's real, but in general, it could be any point on this radius of distance alpha from the origin. And for this problem, we had our z transform, and the region of convergence was all the points whose magnitude was less than the magnitude of alpha. So that is this orange region I've shaded in here. These are all the points in the complex plane whose magnitude is less than alpha. So this is our region of convergence. And again, this point right here is a pole of x of z. This is a point where x of z blows up. If I let z equals alpha, I get alpha over 0, which is infinity. So that is a pole of x of z when z equals alpha. Here, the way it's been drawn, it's been drawn specifically assuming that alpha was real. But in general, we could have had a complex value alpha, and the pole would still be when z equals alpha. So that concludes this problem. Again, we started with a discrete time signal. We computed the transform, found its region of convergence, sketched the region of convergence, and identified poles of the z-transform.